Welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shell, and I'm joined by Ied Darris and Sam Spieler. Hey. Hello. Hi. Today we are reading the last book in our series on Afrofuturism with Ishmael Reed's Mumbo Jumbo. If you'd like to join our discussion, you can find our book club on Reddit by clicking on the link in the episode description. You can also support us and your local bookstore by using our bookshop.org link, which is in our episode description as well. At the store page, you can find books for our book club and other books that we recommend. We are also on social media at Canonical Pod. Next week, we'll be having an in-depth discussion of Mumbo Jumbo. We hope you'll join us for that one as well. So this pick was mine, and I think it's typical of an Iad pick versus a James pick or a Sam pick. (laughs) I think it's a really unique book, and it's unlike anything else I've read. It's an adventure story, but it's got academic endnotes. It's a compendium of obscurities concerning African people and diaspora people. It goes all the way back from ancient Egypt to the 20th century. It's an introduction to voodoo, also known as Vodun or Hoodoo in America. It also has a bit of history about the U.S. occupation of Haiti at the beginning of the 20th century, and even more things. I think the book itself, regardless of the the narrative, is very interesting as well because it has a lot of photos, news stories, handwritten letters, illustrations, and it has a bunch of different typefaces. For me, definitely, this is the best thing from Ishmael Reed that I've read, and I think most people consider it his magnum opus as well. Speaking of those images and stuff, um, were those really tiny and and hard to make out in your copies? Yes, because I was reading from an ebook, and my ebook had very, very small images. If I could get a hold of the original copy or printed copy, I'd imagine the images would be much more impressive. Well, mine was an ebook too, but it was not tiny. It was um it fit my screen. But for example, the handwritten that letter. That was hard to read. Yes. I it was very difficult to read. And some of the photos were they felt like thumbnails. Do you think the pictures were important for you? Like did it add much to your read? Not really. Uh, Some of them were interesting, but most of the time I was trying to connect them with what was happening on the page, and usually there wasn't much connection. Yeah, I felt the same way. I actually thought it could have been better without. I, I guess I'll modify that. I'll say that I don't really see the point beyond it being an intellectual exercise. It's kind of like the illustrations in an academic monograph, right? Like you'd have this caption underneath it, say like figure one, a minstrel show. But you also have that letter. It gives you the sense that it's a real text. Yeah. Um, And I'm not sure I needed that in the book. I thought, you know, what's the point of the letter really? But beyond him showing us that he can do it. So the main plot of the novel is an epidemic of something called Jess Grew in America. So Jess Grew is a contagious affliction, and it makes the carrier lose inhibition and become more prone to dancing and partying. Throughout America, people are monitoring the spread, and they're either trying to avoid it or trying to catch it. The main character is our protagonist. He's called Papa Laba, and he is a Hungan, which is the spiritual leader of the hoodoo Mumbo Jumbo Cathedral in Harlem. His foe, his nemesis, is an antagonist called Hinkle von Vampton. They all have ridiculous names, but his foe is Hinkle von Vampton, and he's a member of a secret society that's dedicated to preserving monotheism, repression, and white dominance. He plans to infiltrate African American culture in order to discover the secret to stop Jess Grew, which is a threat to this kind of worldwide white repressive dominance that they have going on. I think the the white names are more ridiculous. Most of the, the black names are either based on real people or based on some other figure for like Papa Leba is taken from Papa Legba. 
What about Black Herman? Black Herman is Papa Labaz's friend. That's a real person. Black Herman was a magician back around that era, I believe. What if I start calling you White Sam? <laughs> uh, I would ask, who, who are your other Sams? Fair enough. Well, let, let's get into it. I thought that this novel was good. I had mixed expectations. I wasn't sure what it would be like because it is so unique. And it is not as good as I had hoped because I am really interested in postmodern sort of experimental storytelling. And with all of the illustrations and you know handwritten notes and stuff, I thought it would be much more exciting than it was, but it was still enjoyable. To my mind, the novel has two things going for it. It calls upon two powers. The first thing it has is a conspiracy theorist sort of power of uncovering hidden truth. Because a lot of this novel is about uncovering kind of hidden lore about African people and diaspora people. And then the second thing it has going for it is the power of invention. Because it is very wild and freewheeling, you have the sense that you are exploring the bounds of Ishmael Reed's mind. That to me is attractive. Both of them are attractive, but it seems to me like he wants to have it both ways. He wants you to think that what he's telling you is true, but it's also made up. And I think that those two kinds of things cancel each other out. So that caused a kind of a... I don't know if I want to call it a paradox, but when I was reading it, the two ways that I could enjoy it were fighting with each other. It is an adventure story. It's kind of like an Indiana Jones style search for a missing book. But even though it's a non-academic text, it's heavily annotated and it has a long list of notes at the end of the book, which makes it seem like it has some claims to truth. What did you guys think about those end notes? I didn't look into them too much. At the beginning, I paid attention to them a lot. And after the beginning, it, it just felt like a distraction. They weren't really informing me of anything. So I started to ignore them. Yeah, it's the same for me. I I think that in this book, there's an intent that's very clear on the part of the author. Ishmael Reed wants us to enact a certain kind of reading but it's not the kind of reading I enjoy. I don't want to do this kind of reading that he wants me to do. So I didn't do it. Like I did not invest in like looking up all the end notes or trying to see, oh, is this a historical figure? And how does this interact with what actually happened in history? Uh, it's not something I enjoy doing. It just feels like homework to me. So I just kind of ignored it. I guess what I'm getting at with my question is how much of this historical account that he's presenting to you do you think might be true? Because he's presented it with notes, it seems like it's supposed to be true in some way. Do you think that Reed himself thinks that these things are true? And does that claim to truth even matter at all when it decides you know, whether or not you like this novel? Well, do you guys agree that this is a novel with a purpose, that he is attempting to get people, the readers, to recognize that there is an alternate history that is uh, worthwhile, that should be known? And this alternate history is one that puts forward an Afrocentric view of the world, or if not Afrocentric, but at least a Black American-centric view of the world? Yes, I, I agree. To Iad's point, it felt like it was doing that, it was driving that purpose by similarly creating this mythology, just as he's pointing out that Western civilization has created a mythology around itself. Right. So for me, it's both. I didn't see it as opposing forces because it's creating a mythology, but it's also creating a history. I think that's the thing that Ied is getting at, that there's history and there's mythology, and where that boundary is is often blurred here and difficult to figure out where that line actually is. Um, I, I can't claim to know what Reed believes, but I read it as fiction with um, some truths and some 
threads of kind of this rib jabbing what ifs rather than complete fact or even 50% fact. Um, there, there are definitely things that felt like they could be true and definitely things that I knew were true. But then there were other things that felt not just false, but that they were supposed to be false, that it was either in jest or purposefully trumped up. I had issues with this book as a reader, but my issue did not lie with trying to discern whether or not it was true. Like this kind of conflict between history and mythology did not actually bother me. Let me bring up two examples here, because I think that they oppose each other in a certain way. Listeners of a certain age may remember a viral video online called Zeitgeist that came out in 2007, which has a very similar sort of idea about ancient Egyptian religion influencing world religion, which is very present in mumbo jumbo. And it's presented to us as a conspiracy. It's presented to us as hidden truth. And watching that video, even if you don't believe it, and I think most people, sensible people, don't believe it, there is the thrill of discovering something hidden, being presented with something that's true and was hidden from you. That's one sort of thrill that we could be getting from Mumbo Jumbo. But then also think about the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, That's presented to us as a more straight-ahead thriller, but also with conspiracy elements surrounding the Catholic Church. We read that book, and we don't believe that it's true, and we get a different sort of pleasure from it. So is mumbo-jumbo closer to one or the other? What separates mumbo-jumbo from either of these works? It's a little bit in its own category, but those are interesting comparisons. Zeitgeist makes a lot of claims, and it's one of those things where there's a kernel of truth, but around that kernel is a whole bunch of made-up BS. A lot of poo-poo around your kernels. Well, you know how corn just goes through the body. But it's dressed up as complete truth. The, the person or people making Zeitgeist fully believe that it's true. Uh, I feel this is a little closer to Da Vinci Code in that it is fiction and meant to be fiction. It does stand apart from that also in that I think we are supposed to take more of this as truth. So, Ian, why do you think this question matters to you as a reader? The first thing I would like to say is that if Reed had decided from the beginning which of these two powers he wanted to call upon, he could have gone more strongly in one way or the other. Here, I think the comparison I would make is something like Thomas Pynchon's The Crying of Lot 49, which also features a made-up conspiracy theory sort of group called Thurnan Taxis, which actually existed, but it was used in the novel as this kind of ridiculous secret society. Because it was decided to be ridiculous from the beginning, it was amplified in an interesting and appealing way. That is something that I think that Reed could have leaned into even more if he had given up on this idea of being a conspiracy theorist sort of exposer of truth. Didn't you see that with the atonism, though? So in the book, we have these atonists who are based on this ancient religion, this very short-lived religion in Egypt. Um worshiping the sun god Aten, which might have been the first or one of the first monotheistic beliefs. And it is built up into this kind of ridiculous, overly ridiculous conspiracy that leads us into a present-day cabal that runs the white-slash-Western world. It felt to me like, yeah, maybe Reed believes that there's some truth to this, but Mostly, it it just felt like it's supposed to be ridiculous. The characters running this cabal, from Hinkle to the Hierophant, they're all very ridiculous characters. That's true. I think that it is ridiculous, but I think that this brings me to my second problem, the second reason to answer James's question about why this type of reading matters to me, is that the stakes are higher here. 
because the stakes in mumbo jumbo are not just telling a good story, but rather, as I read it, at least the reclamation of African and diaspora people's way of life and their cultural production. I think that he's trying to show the reader something that can be a potential source of pride or a potential source of belonging for African and diaspora people. And the things that he's drawing upon are so real and so present in our lives that I think that it's not something that you can play around with as easily as you can play around with like Thurn and Taxis or you can play around with Atonism. Because, you know, while Atonism existed many, many years ago, the things that it represents in the novel are still very real to a lot of African American and Black people worldwide. I think what he's trying to do here is he's making a rhetorical point where the Black history is actually history, and the white history or beliefs are mythology. That's what he's done here in the text, right? So um, the Atonists are all white, as far as I can remember. There are a lot of characters in the book. Um, But as far as I know, all the characters who are Atonists are white. So he's kind of flipped the script, as it were. How I read it is he's centering the Black voodoo experience in truth, or the Black experience in truth, and he's decentering the white experience in conspiracy or in myth. Right. But again, he starts blurring those lines, for example, when he goes into that long history. Yes, right. that's where it becomes interesting, also problematic, uh, the, the mm-hmm. very end of the book. And I'm not sure if I like it. Um, I, I'm really undecided on if I like that ending. But I did really enjoy that. Uh, even though I, I also felt that it was problematic, but I chose to read it as just fiction with a purpose. And this was, I think, one of the funniest books we've read, uh, intentionally funny. And I was already enjoying it until that halfway mark. And then when you get to that halfway mark, when he starts going into a uh, history, um, I'll just leave it at that. I felt it got even funnier. I really enjoyed it. There's a lot of anachronisms that felt very intentional at times and also sometimes not necessarily intentional. For example, he characterizes the language of ancient Egypt as a very distinctly 1970s New York style of street English versus he talks about the invention of the electric guitar, which did not happen in the 1920s, which is when this takes place, but I believe in the 30s. There's a lot of things like that where it's hard to tell what exactly Reed believes. It goes to the point you guys are both talking about that there is a problem there, but I chose to not take it as a big problem. I thought it was funny, but I didn't think it was very funny. It's not like a confederacy of dunces. That was much more obviously funny. Here, I think the humor is much drier. It's never presented as an obvious setup, but rather it's something that Reed expects his reader will pick up on. And I guess that's where I'm kind of coming from, is that it could have been funnier if he had decided to just go all in with the ridiculousness. There are definitely jokes that I feel went over my head, but even though I don't think it's as clearly funny as A Confederacy of Dunces, I didn't feel it was that far off. There's a lot of satire going on from beginning to end, and a lot of it is pretty good satire. So... I think what we're kind of circling around here is this question of, is this actually, like, aesthetically a good novel? Because I think on the ideal level, it offers quite a lot to think about. But do you think aesthetically, is it a good read? Is it something that you thought, okay, at the end of this, as a work of art, something you can appreciate? Like, did you appreciate it on that level? Not on the idea level, but on the level of a novel you want to read. 
I never think that way. This is something that came up in our last discussion. When we were talking about parable of the sower, you said something similar, like, oh, I don't really consider it that way. I just think about, do I want to continue reading it? For me, personally, I never separate the experience of the idea from the pleasure of reading. To me, they are the same thing. I'm not exactly talking about that. What I'm saying is that you're saying there's something here that's making this book a less than coherent whole. Like, aesthetically, it's not coherent. Like, that's how I read your question, and I agree with you. I think that's what we're all saying, right? We are all saying that on the idea level, okay, it's interesting, but there's something here that's not coherent. There's a chaos to it. I think the incoherence that I'm kind of pointing towards is at the level of ideas. And at the level of ideas, it's kind of conflicting with itself. It's a paradox. At the level of enjoyment, I could kind of set that aside, but the only reason why I don't is because I feel like this insistence on truth interferes with the novel being as playful and as ridiculous as it could be otherwise. Well, sticking with this idea of his ability to convey what he wants or this coherence, do you think he's a good writer, like based solely on this book? It's something I was thinking about all throughout the book, as I could not decide if he was actually a good writer or not. Because to me, it reads like he could have just as easily made this into an essay. For example, we looked at the neo Hoodoo Manifesto. Like, obviously, it's different from what we read here in this novel, but he could have expressed those ideas in other forms. That's something you're always fond of saying, Yed. So do you think, as a novel, like, is he actually a good writer? I'll, I'll give you some pros and cons, because I was thinking about this all throughout. I think that he's really bad at writing scenes. He, it's really confusing. I think he's doing it purposefully, which is, you know, maybe an out, but at the same time, if you're purposefully writing a confusing scene, it doesn't make it better. It just means you're purposefully doing something because you're sacrificing what you think is less important, which is to write a good scene. I think that on the sentence level, he's okay. Like, he's funny, but it's not hard to write the kind of funny that he's writing. Um, there's a lot of cultural in-jokes. Like, that's not especially hard. Uh, there's nothing beautiful about his sentences. I think in terms of characterization, there's almost none. Uh, it's very shallow. I mean, I, I'm just thinking, like, in terms of what's actually here from page to page, a lot of cons. <laughs> I mean, the pros, I would say, are he weaves together a lot of different ideas, which is hard to do. He writes a lot of different characters, not always well, but he kind of puts them, moves them around like chess pieces, and it's kind of interesting to see. And what he's created fosters a lot of discussion. So, you know, obviously he's created something that's kind of like a master work. But, like, is it good? I, I, I don't think it is. I think that's where I ultimately landed, is I don't think it's actually good writing for a novel. It really depends on what you want from a novel, though, doesn't it, James? Like, these things that you're talking about in terms of craft, I agree with you. His scenes are bad, his characterization is bad, his dialogue is bad, but the ideas are there. And if that is, as it is for me, like the key feature, the most important part of a novel, if the ideas are there, that's really what matters most for me. And clearly, it's different for you. The sum is larger than its parts here. Uh, I think that was what it was important for me. I agree also with all of your points, especially your negative points, James, but I don't think you can really separate them or it, it does fall apart. But together, uh, even though I, I wouldn't call it cohesive, it does make a all-around worthwhile good book. Good novel, I maybe not, but a good book altogether, yes. Yeah, and that's the Ead question, right? Because if none of the pillars of fiction are actually working very well here, why even have it as a novel? Why not just have it as an essay? Um, better audience, probably. Uh, that's that's what I would think. Right, mm. but I mean, I mean, this is what yeah, what you've brought up before, right? Like, if something obviously is better suited for a different medium, then it's a flawed novel, even if the ideas are good. 
I mean, this is what I'm probing here. I'm not saying it's a bad novel because I, like I said, I'm very conflicted. It's definitely one of a kind and it's very interesting and I don't regret reading it. But at the end of it, I'm just thinking, well, what is it exactly? Even though I understand Ed's point in the past about whether a given medium is the best choice, I understand the point of the question, but... In most cases where it's been brought up, I have mostly dismissed it, uh, as I do here. I think it's fine. I I enjoyed this as a novel. Even though it does have problems, I can still look back on it and say, yeah, I'm very glad I read this book. And I think it works on some level, even if it doesn't work on all levels. I guess my point here overall is we've criticized other books for having the flaws that this book has. So it's really interesting to me because I'm always with you, Sam, in that I think, oh, it's a big tent, you know, anything can be a novel. But this, for me, is like almost the furthest I could go. Like this Hmm. book, when I finished reading it, and it's not even the fact that I disliked it because I think I enjoyed the process and I don't regret reading it. It's just at the end of it, I'm really like, if, if there's one book that will make me think maybe it should be in another form, it's this book. Because it feels like it doesn't fit its clothes. I think the humor and the ideas were enough for me to lift it up and package it in those wrong clothes and still be okay with it. James, I think you and I are going to have to have some separate episode where we discuss what is and isn't a novel and what a novel should do. Because... Well, your criticisms are valid, I don't think that any of those criticisms point to something inherent in what a novel should be that prevent Mumbo Jumbo from being very firmly a novel. Maybe it's not a great novel, maybe it's not a good novel, but I don't think that Mumbo Jumbo could work and do the same things that it does as an essay. I think if it were an essay, a lot of its magic would be gone. I agree with that. I don't think we're too far apart on that note. Um, it goes back to your question of what he wants to do. Like, wh- what is the the purpose? Because if his purpose is to present this alternate history, yeah, you could do it in a novel, but he hasn't really done it well here. And you could do it as an essay, too. And he kind of does that a little bit with what's in this book. On that note, I guess we'll take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. So we've talked about how this book feels very 1970s. Do you think the version of Black Empowerment that Reed offers here is different from what we see from contemporary activists? Yeah, it does feel dated to a certain degree. It it reminds me of a lot of politics that were going on in the 70s and in the, I, I guess, the 20s as well. Things that we don't see very much today, this kind of return to Africa, whereas now we're seeing much more of Black empowerment, but Black empowerment in a we're here to stay and you need to recognize us rather than we're going to take our ball and go home kind of thing. Yeah, I think that the contemporary identity politics are much more about drawing distinctions and asserting that there is value even if things are distinct. So I don't think that in contemporary African-American discourse, there is this kind of ideology that we are of a piece in some way with Africans in Africa or African diaspora people in Haiti or elsewhere. It's that we are African-Americans and our experience is distinct, but still valuable in its distinction. It doesn't need to draw its power from any sort of historical basis. 
Do you think this would be published today? I think it could be. I actually don't think that this book would be published very easily by a mass market publisher. I think it might be picked up by an alternative press, but certainly not by a mainstream press. And I don't think that it would get the attention that it did get in 1972. Yeah, that's kind of how I felt. I think it's deserving of its place in fiction, but partly because of all the problems we talked about, it doesn't feel to me, uh, as good as it is, it doesn't feel to me that it would be picked up by a large publisher. So what is its place in fiction? Because I think we would all agree that it has some place in a canon. Like, I I would firmly believe that even as someone who thought it was a flawed book, I thought, you know, people do need to read this book. But where do you think this book is uh, in the discourse today? Where should it be? Do you think this is something that young Black people should read? Do you think that this is something that academics should be talking about? Is it so dated that even people who are in African-American studies, like, should they not be considering this book? I think they should consider this book, but the, the only pause I have there is if this is treated as 100% fact. Um, I feel like it, it does have to be read with a certain amount of tongue-in-cheek understanding and skepticism. I think the the ideas behind it and the rhetoric is still important and worth tapping into. But because of the problems we mentioned and because of the strange blurring between truth and fiction, I, I feel like there does have to be actual discourse around it rather than presenting it as gospel, so to speak. I think sort of like what Iad mentioned earlier, this call toward an Egyptian mythology would not resonate with young people today. I think that, like Yet said, it's not what people rely on for their identity. Like, I don't know any of my contemporaries, any of my Black contemporaries who are, I guess, hearkening back to Egypt and talking about, you know, how, how they're proud of the pyramids or whatever. Like, it's such a strange, outdated way of thinking. It's a kind of exoticism, isn't it? It's like a weird sort of exoticism in a way. Yeah, you know, it's it's in an Egypt that doesn't exist anymore. And perhaps never existed. Um, maybe never existed. And it's certainly that reverence that we see here in the book for Egypt does not exist anymore in this way. You do still see some black Americans taking on African, you know, Swahili sure. names, but that it seems is perhaps waning as well. Um, I don't see it as much, but if people were interested in doing that, I wouldn't object to it necessarily in the same way that I would say that this kind of embrace Egyptian culture as a kind of a rooting is as questionable as it is here in mumbo jumbo. Yeah, I think this... And this is, of course, all three of us are not Black, so <laughs> we're looking at it from the outside, of course. But it seems to me that when people do sort of go to their roots, when they look toward Africa, um, they're looking at where their families actually came from, like Nigeria. You know, it's kind of like, for me as a Chinese-American, it, it's very strange if I started looking to Persia and Persian history and saying, oh, yeah, like, those Persian kings were great. And I feel so proud, you know, because of those uh, Persian kings and that awesome makeup and eyeliner. Like, you know, it's, it's weird. Like, people, I think, nowadays are much more discerning about where their roots actually lie. Uh, they're not just going to say, oh, this is this continent and that's where I'm from. And therefore, I pick, you know, this from that part of the continent. Like, I, I think people nowadays just wouldn't think about it in that way. I, I will say, though, that, you know, the experience of Black Americans being kidnapped and brought to another continent, it deprives them of access to history in a certain way. So the move towards Africa in general 
is understandable. It could be understood, at least in my mind, again, clearly not black, as less so much of an embrace of Africa as a rejection of the white slaver. Right. You know, why would you want to continue to carry the slave master's name? Well, not only that, but recognition of how Egypt was, you know, a cradle or the cradle of civilization, that it it really was a beginning of things. We do recognize Egypt as a birthplace for many things. And while, while that's kind of generalized here as all of Africa, I think there is a recognition here that it was a birthplace. I mean, I agreed on both points. And I think all I'm saying really, maybe I'm giving our generation too much credit, but I feel like people in our generation are more discerning about claiming ancestry. I don't think they would just go and claim like Egypt. I think they would claim, you know, um, Western Africa. Yeah, and I'm saying you're wrong. (laughs) Fair enough. No, no, I agree. Is there anyone that you would not recommend this book to? Because I know there are people that I wouldn't recommend it to. I feel like this is a very niche book. Really? See, I think it's important. I think it is worth recommending to people, except I would not tell, um, I guess, severe Christian people about it? People that can't take a joke, maybe? What about black Christians who can't take a joke? What about black Muslims? If they really can't take a joke, then no, but I don't, I don't think I wouldn't bring it up to them. I think it would be worthwhile. I would recommend this book to everybody with the obvious caveat that this is, you know, of a time and it's not my particular worldview, but a worldview. I think everyone would benefit from seeing this book, whether or not they accept it as truth or not. If they are the type of people who can't take a joke, as it were, I wouldn't recommend any book to them (laughs) because they're obviously not receptive to anything. So what's the point? Why are you talking to those people? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, I wouldn't. I would not recommend this book to illiterates. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it to five-year-olds either. Five-year-olds probably would not yeah. get it. Well, it's just because the pictures are so boring. Yeah. I think we're getting a little punchy here. So let's <laughs> conclude. Thank you for listening. If you thought we were off base with our review of Mumbo Jumbo, you can let us know on Reddit. That link is below. You can also find us on social media at Canonical Pod. We'll be back next week with an in depth discussion of this book. If you're interested in joining that discussion, go ahead and find a copy of this book and make sure you subscribe to us so you will know when that episode comes out on Friday. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.